We talked about long-term memory in the last two chapters. Now we're going to talk about disorders of memory. <clears throat> there we go. Amnesia is the name given to disorders of memory. Amnesia normally involves severe forgetfulness, which goes beyond the everyday forgetting observed in normal people to the extent that it may interfere with the activities of normal life. Everyone is prone to moments of forgetfulness, but most people with intact cognitive functioning can remember quite a lot about their lives, especially their most recent experiences and events which are important to them. A person suffering from amnesia may be quite unable to remember any recent events. Without an intact memory, it can become impossible to keep a job, to keep up relationships with family and friends, or even to look after oneself and maintain an independent existence. It is clear from the study of severely amnesic patients that memory is quite crucial to our ability to function properly as human beings. Amnesia may arise from a number of different causes, which can be divided into two main groups organic amnesias, and the psychogenic amnesias. Organic amnesias are caused by some form of physical damage known as a lesion inflicted on the brain. This may arise from a, from a variety of causes, including brain infections, strokes, head injuries, and degenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. Psychogenic amnesias are caused by psychological factors and usually involve the temporary suppression of memories which are distressing to the patient. Psychogenic amnesias can be disorienting and disruptive, but they are rarely completely disabling, and as there is no actual brain damage, they are reversible and in most cases will eventually disappear. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of, of amnesia. It is a degenerative brain disorder which first appears as an impairment of memory, but later develops into a more general dementia affecting all aspects of co cognition. Alzheimer's disease occurs mostly in the elderly, and in fact it is the main cause of senile dementia, affecting as many as 20% of elderly people. Although seen mainly in people who are at least 70 to 80 years old, in rare cases, Alzheimer's disease may affect younger people when it is referred to as pre-senile dementia. Uh, Alzheimer's disease was first identified by Aloysius uh, Alzheimer in 1907, uh, though the cases he described in fact concerned the pre-senile form. It was only later realized that the same basic degenerative disorder, with its characteristic pattern of damaged and tangled neural fibers, was also responsible for most senile dementias too. Since the amnesic uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease patients are usually complicated by additional symptoms of general dementia, including significantly impaired intelligence, it is difficult to carry out tests of memory function in Alzheimer's disease cases. Um, <clears throat> I was working in medicine uh, from the 70s uh, until uh, about 2000 and uh, when we first start when I first started teaching psychology one of the things that we talked about was the fact that uh, there were very few people with Alzheimer's disease and almost everybody had what they referred to as senile dementia. <clears throat> it was like 10% of the cases are, are all of Alzheimer's uh, are Alzheimer's disease and the, and the other 90% are senile dementia. Since then they've changed the definition of both senile dementia and Alzheimer's disease uh, and now of course they recognize that Alzheimer's disease is the main cause of, of uh, what used to be called senile dementia. <clears throat> and so they've changed the names um, I, I think they were probably referring to uh, uh, pre-senile dementia uh, with the Alzheimer's disease. I had a friend in college whose father <clears throat> died of uh, pre-senile dementia in his 50s. Um, he, he was an inventor and he invented uh, uh, transmissions for vehicles. 
and if you drive an, uh, an automatic transmission vehicle, uh, probably my friend is getting uh, pennies on the dollar uh, of what it costs to, to manufacture that uh, uh, that transmission. But sadly, his father came down with um, pre-senile dementia and um, couldn't function anymore after he was in his 40s and died in his early 50s. Karsakoff syndrome is a brain disease which usually results from chronic alcoholism, and it is mainly characterized by a memory impairment. It was first described by Korsakoff in 1887, and it has become one of the most frequently studied amnesic conditions, mainly because it usually presents as a relatively pure form of amnesia without the complication of extensive dementia or reduced intelligence. Uh, Korsakoff was, of course, Russian. Um, and in Russia, people drink a lot of vodka, which was, is almost pure alcohol. Or in some forms is almost pure alcohol. So uh, this is one of the reasons why Korsakoff is the first to see this. Uh, what happened with other individuals <clears throat> uh, in other countries is the fact that uh, uh, Alzheimer's, or Alzheimer's disease, Korsakoff syndrome, uh, they weren't living long enough to uh, develop Korsakoff syndrome or drinking strong enough alcohol. Herpes simplex uh, encephalitis is a virus infection of the brain, which can leave the patient severely amnesic. Fortunately, cases of HSE, uh, hepatitis simplex uh, encephalitis, are very rare. Uh, one important characteristic of uh, HSE uh, amnesia is its relatively sudden onset, which means that in many cases, the date of onset of amnesic Symptoms is known with reasonable accuracy, in contrast to the very gradual onset of degenerative disorders such as Korsakoff syndrome and Alzheimer's cases. Temporal lobe surgery, a very small number of patients have become amnesic as a result of brain lesions caused by surgical procedures, usually involving the temporal lobes. Such cases are fortunately very rare but they have been extensively studied because they provide a particularly valuable source of knowledge about memory. This is because the precise moment of onset of, the, of their amnesia is known, and the extent of their lesions are also known fairly accurately. And in this case, this is before surgery. Uh, there it is right there. These two lumps right there, and they've taken that chunk out, as you can see. That's why they had uh, cut into their temporal lobe and stapled it shut. Post-ECT amnesia, electroconvulsive therapy is a treatment used to alleviate depression, usually in patients who have failed to respond to any alternative forms of therapy. ECT involves the administering of, electrical, uh, of electric shock across the front of the patient's head. It has been found that a period of amnesia may follow the administering of the shock, and in some cases this amnesia may persist over longer periods. ECT-induced amnesia has been uh, extensively studied because it can be a serious side effect of a deliberately administered treatment. It is therefore important to establish the severity and duration of post-ECT amnesia in order to, ev to evaluate the usefulness of the treatment. Other causes of organic amnesia, uh, since any condition which damages the appropriate areas of the brain can cause amnesia, there are many other possible causes. Strokes and tumors can sometimes lead to amnesia, as uh, can head injuries, cardiac arrest, HIV infections, and degenerative conditions such as Huntington's, chorea, and Parkinson's disease. The main symptom of organic uh, organic amnesic syndrome is an impairment of long-term memory so that organic amnesics have difficulty in consolidating new information into their long-term memory store and they also often have problems retrieving old memories from storage. Despite this long-term memory impairment, 
Organic amnesics uh, usually have an intact short-term memory. One clear indication of their intact short-term memory is the fact that most organic amnesics are able to carry on a fairly normal conversation, though their conversation will be somewhat limited by their inability to recall earlier events. <clears throat> Research of measurements of short-term memory functions, such as digit span involving Corsica uh, patients, uh, patients suffering from HSC, the herp herpes simplex encephalitis, amnesia, uh, temp temporal lobe surgery patients, and the patients in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, have shown intact short-term memory, though in the later stages, Alzheimer's patients do show a deterioration of short-term memory performance reflecting the general dementia which eventually pervades all aspects of their cognitive functioning. Alzheimer's patients usually show no impairment of the phonological and articulatory loops, but they suffer increasing impairment of central executive function. Having studied about 30 cases of severe amnesia associated with alcoholic abuse, Korsakoff concluded that the main symptom was an impairment of the memory of recent events. He added that in many cases there were also uh, an impairment of memory for the long, uh, the long past, uh, which could extend as far back as 30 years before onset. These two types of amnesia roughly correspond to the definitions of anterograde and ret retrograde. Anterograde amnesia AA is the impairment of memory for events occurring since the onset of amnesia. Retrograde amnesia is the impairment of memory for events occurring before the onset of amnesia. Uh, the distinction between anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia offers a possible means of distinguishing between learning disorders and retrieval disorders. A patient suffering from learning impairment would be expected to have a, a, a anterograde amnesia, but not a room, a retro, a retrograde amnesia, since they should, not, should have no difficulty in retrieving memories from the period before onset when their learning ability was unimpaired. A patient suffering from a retrieval impairment would have difficulty in retrieving memories from any period in the past and would thus be expected to have both uh, anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia. An observation first noted by Rabat in 1882 is that amnesic patients often have clear memories of their childhood and early adulthood despite being unable to remember more recent periods in their lives. Rabat concluded that their retrograde amnesia showed a temporal gradient, since the temporal in this case meaning time, since the degree of impairment increased with the recency of the event. This observation has become known as Rabat's Law. Uh, more recent studies have shown that it does not uh, apply universally, since some amnesic patients have a uniformly dense, uh, uniformly dense rheumatoid arthritis without any obvious temporal gradient. <clears throat> the earliest amnesia studies suggested that most amnesic patients suffer from both uh, anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia, and more recent studies have generally confirmed this finding. A pattern of uh, anterograde amnesia together with uh, retrograde amnesia has been observed in Alzheimer's patients in Korsakoff's patients, and in uh, hepatitis simplex encephalitis patients. In many cases, retrograde amnesia extends back over a very long time period. In Korsakoff's uh, patients, uh, rheumatoid, arth rheumatoid. <laughs> rheumatoid arthritis, I'm sorry. So RA means rheumatoid arthritis. It also means retrograde amnesia. But we're, talk we're using retrograde amnesia. Okay. So in Korsakoff patients, retrograde amnesia typically extends back over a period of 30 years or more before onset and usually shows a marked temporal gradient in accordance with Rabat's law. 
Most amnesics uh, exhibit both uh, anterograde amnesia and, and uh, <laughs> retrograde amnesia, but a few cases have been studied who show either anterograde amnesia or retro retrograde amnesia in uh, isolation. A number of studies have reported cases of focal anterograde amnesia, anterograde amnesia without retrograde amnesia. While sitting at his desk, N.A. was accidentally stabbed with a fencing coil. The, the foil, I'm sorry, fencing foil, not coil. The foil entered N.A.'s nostril and penetrated his brain with devastating effect. And here you go, there's the, the foil penetrating its brain. The area chiefly damaged was N.A.'s thalamus, and it left him with severe uh, anterograde amnesia, but without any significant amount of retrograde amnesia. Other studies of focal anterograde amnesia uh, have confirmed that damage is mostly restricted to the anterior thalamus. Examples of focal retrograde amnesia, retrograde amnesia without uh, anterograde amnesia, are extremely rare. Mays in 2002 points out that most cases are of psychogenic origin. A few cases of focal uh, retrograde amnesia have been reported in patients after suffering head injuries and following an epileptic seizure, which have mostly affected the temporal cortex. From these rare and unusual cases, it appears that impairments in learning and retrieval can uh, occur separately, with, uh, which suggests that they are independent disorders. The brains of amnesic patients have been studied in an effort to identify the main sites where lesions, uh, for example, injuries, have occurred. Uh, brain scans have detected a number of lesion sites which had not previously been revealed by post-mortem studies. Several brain areas have been identified where lesions tend to be found in cases of organic am uh, amnesia, uh, notably the temporal lobes, the hippocampus, which lies within the temporal lobes, the thalamus, and the prefrontal lobes. The temporal lobes and hippocampus are damaged in most cases of uh, herpes simplex encephalitis. Their lesions are usually more extensive and may involve most of the temporal cortex. Similar temporal uh, lobe lesions are found in early stages of Alzheimer's disease, Though in the later stages of this progressive condition, there are more extensive lesions extending into the forebrain at first and later affecting most of the areas of the brain. And these, this is the lesion that we're talking about, this right here. The other area of the brain where lesions tend to produce uh, anterograde amnesia is the diencephalon, a region which includes the thalamus and the mammillary bodies. And this is the thalamus right here and those are the mammillary bodies. These are the areas which usually da are damaged in Korsakoff patients. Although Korsakoff's uh, patients tend to suffer damage to much of the diencephalon, their amnesic uh, symptoms are mainly associated with lesions in the anterior thalamic nuclei. Research has shown that the hippocampus, anterior thalamus, and mammillary bodies are interconnected and appear to work as a single system. This system is known as the extended hippocampal system and appears to operate as a, blinked, a linked circuit which carries out the encoding and consolidation of new memories. The retrieval of old memories seems to involve different regions of the brain, notably the temporal cortex and the prefrontal cortex. And of course, this is a picture of the prefrontal cortex. Some Korsakoff uh, patients have prefrontal lesions in addition to their diencephalic lesions, and these patients are more likely to exhibit retrieval problems than those without such lesions. Koppelman et al. in 2001 established that in Korsakoff patients, the severity of, of uh, anterograde amnesia is cor correlated with the extent of thalamic damage, whereas the severity of retrograde amnesia is correlated with the extent of prefrontal damage. There's your temporal cortex. Lesions in the temporal cortex, for example, the cortical area surrounding the hippocampus, 
are also associated with retrieval problems. Uh, herpes simplex encephalitis patients whose lesions extend beyond the hippocampus and include large areas of the temporal cortex usually exhibit severe retrograde amnesia in addition to their uh, dense anterograde amnesia. Ste Stefanacci et al. in 2001 reported that in herpes simplex encephalitis patients, and pterograde amnesia is correlated with the extent of hippocampal lesions, while uh, retrograde amnesia is correlated with the extent of lesions in the lateral temporal cortex. Motor skills tend to be very durable in normal people, and there is considerable evidence that motor skills are also preserved in organic amnesics. Not only do amnesics uh, tend to retain their old skills from before onset, they can also learn how they can also learn new skills and procedures, even in patients who find most other forms of learning impossible. This suggests that skill learning is fundamentally different to other forms of learning, perhaps because skills are performed in an automatic way without needing conscious recollection. Amnesic patients, mostly with temporal lobe lesions caused by herpes simplex encephalitis, display completely normal performance on a wide range of skills, including weaving, figure tracing, and target tracking. Aldman et al. in 2015 showed that Korsakoff's patients retain the ability to learn new motor skills. Gliski et al. in 1986 successfully trained amnesics to carry out simple computer tasks. Skill learning in amnesics is highly inflexible, possibly because it is learned at an automatic level without full conscious control. A number of studies have suggested that organic amnesics retain the ability to detect the familiarity of a previously encountered item, but have difficulty recollecting the context from which it is familiar. Recent studies have confirmed that familiarity-based recognition is rel relatively unimpaired in amnesics. Tolving in 1989 suggested that amnesics suffer a selective impairment of episodic memory while their semantic memory remains intact. Episodic memory refers to memory for specific events, in our lives and therefore involves a conscious retrieval of the event and its context. Uh, for example, where and when the event took place. Semantic memory refers to the store of knowledge we possess, such as the meaning of words, and it requires no contextual retrieval and no conscious re-experiencing of an event. Research has shown that episodic memory tends to be far more severely impaired than semantic memory in most organic amnesics. But semantic memory can also be impaired to some degree. Korsakoff patients usually have a severe impairment of the episodic memory, but with some semantic impairment uh, too, as shown by their poor ability to learn new languages, to learn new vocabulary, excuse me. <clears throat> Studies of retrograde episodic uh, versus semantic memory uh, amnesia in Korsakoff's have also revealed impairments of both semantic memory, for example, identifying famous people, and episodic memory, for example, retrieving personal autobiographical events. Similar impairments of both semantic memory and episodic memory have been reported in hepatitis simply. <laughs> simplex encephalitis. Alzheimer's patients generally show impairment of both episodic and semantic memory, though, though the episodic impairment is usually more severe. Addis and Tippett in 2004 reported that Alzheimer's patients tend to suffer impaired autobiographical memory, extending back over their entire lifespan but their somatic memory impairment is usually more limited. Concussion is one of the most common causes of amnesia, though fortunately the memory disturbance is usually temporary. 
A person who is knocked unconscious by a blow on the head will typically suffer from both anterograde and retrograde amnesia, which may be extensive at first, but which when usually uh, diminish, then usually diminishes with time to leave only a very limited period from which memories are permanently lost. Amnesias of this kind are known as concussion amnesias, and they fall within a broader category known as post-traumatic amnesias, which in include all types of closed head injury. Russell in 1971 surveyed concussion victims and found that retrograde amnesia usually affected memories for a period extending only a minute or two before the accident. During the period immediately following the concussive accident, the patient is likely to show impairment in long-term memory tasks, but will perform normally on tests of short-term memory, such as digit span. The very limited extent of retrograde amnesia suggests that there is usually no lasting impairment to the patient's retrieval. The most likely explanation for this pattern of retrograde amnesia is that the patient is temporarily unable to consolidate memories from the short-term memory, working memory, into the long-term memory store. This would explain why events held in short-term memory immediately before the injury may be lost, because they have not yet been transferred to the long-term memory. Although the effects of concussion on memory are usually temporary, uh, Pollander et al. in 2018 report that at least 10% of concussive injuries may leave a more lasting impairment referred to as post-concussive syndrome. Lasting cognitive impairment is rare with childhood concussive injuries, but it is more common in the elderly. In recent years, evidence has emerged that sports involving frequent head impacts can produce a permanent cognitive impairment. Brain scanning techniques and cognitive tests have revealed that lasting cognitive impairment occurs frequently in boxers. A recent review paper by Gallo et al. in 2020 reported that for boxers, rugby players, and American football players, there was a clear association between a player's concussion history and impaired cognitive function in later life. Electroconvulsive therapy involves the passing of an electric current through the brain in an effort to, to alleviate depression. This treatment has been fairly widespread use for over 50 years, though its use in the treatment of depression remains controversial. Although ECT has been shown to reduce depression in some patients, this improvement typically only lasts for a few weeks. The benefits of ECT thus appear to be temporary and these benefits must be weighed uh, against the, uh, the evidence that ECT may cause lasting brain damage and impaired memory. In the period immediately following the administration of an ECT shock, the patient typically shows a temporary amnesia rather similar to that seen following concussion. There is usually both anterograde and retrograde amnesia, which may be extensive at first, but which usually then shrinks to, to leave a fairly limited amnesia for the retreatment period only. For most patients, there is only a temporary impairment of memory and follow-up tests of memory and performance a few weeks after the com completion of ECT treatment have often failed to detect any lasting memory impairment. A growing number of researchers argue that the limited benefits of ECT cannot be justified in views of its damaging effects on memory and cognition. Some clinicians feel that ECT is still helpful, helpful for patients who do not respond to other forms of treatment. In recent years, some clinicians have begun to replace ECT with TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation which uses the powerful magnet pulse instead of the electric, uh, electric current. I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, yeah. 
It is widely assumed that memory te uh, tends to decline in older people. There is some evidence for such a, an age-related decline. It is not normally detectable until the age of about 65 or 70. And rats, I'm 73. Turn 73 today. Even then, the degree of impairment is usually very small, at least among the normal elderly. The popular view of old age leading inevitably to dementia is certainly not supported, and it is important to recognize the clear distinction between the dementing elderly, such as those with Alzheimer's disease, and the normal elderly, those uh, whose memory function usually shows little impairment. Studies of the normal elderly have often detected some decline in recall ability, but not in recognition performance. <clears throat> elderly subjects tend to show some deterioration of explicit memory, whereas their implicit memory performance remains unimpaired. Elderly people also seem to have particular problems in retrieving episodic context, and indeed it has been recently argued that episodic memory is the most age-sensitive of all memory functions. One possible explanation of age-related uh, memory decline consistent with the above findings is that the elderly lose some of their capacity for conscious, consciously controlled processing and attention and have to rely more heavily on automatic processes. Salthouse in 1994 has presented evidence that the normal elderly show a reduction in their speed of processing rather than any actual deficiency of the processing itself. Salthouse in 2011 has also shown that memory deterioration in the normal elderly mainly involves an impairment at the learning and encoding stage, but with no impairment of retrieval even when tested after several years. Many of the processes which decline in old age involve frontal lobe executive functions, and indeed it has been found that neural loss in the elderly tends to, to affect mainly the frontal lobes. Tisserand and Jolie's, okay. I was trying to read that, okay. Uh, Meta-analysis of studies of executive function in the normal elderly conclude that their cognitive decline is actually very slight. It has also been established that memory decline in the elderly can often be avoided by maintaining a healthy lifestyle and by adopting efficient cognitive strategies. For those of us who are getting aging, who are aging, this is very reassuring. Yes. Huh. I don't know about that. Some amnesias occur without any evidence of brain lesions, and these are assumed to be psychogenic origin. Of psychogenic origin. <clears throat> in most cases, they appear to be brought on by stress, and they are usually temporary typically disappearing within a few months. Psychogenic amnesias usually involve retrograde amnesia, and pterograde amnesia is less common. The pattern of impairment found in psychogenic amnesia varies widely from case to, to case. Koppelman in 2010 observes that psychogenic amnesias can be global, a complete loss of all memories, or situation-specific, amnesia for one specific event only. In extreme cases, the global form may cause amnesia for the person's entire previous life, and they may lose their sense of personal identity as a result. Situation-specific amnesia involves a small group gap in a person's memory, usually relating to a particular traumatic episode. A major problem with psychogenic amnesia is that it is difficult to distinguish if it, if, uh, it from fake, faking Many cases diagnosed as psychogenic amnesia may in reality involve faking amnesic uh, symptoms to support an insurance claim or to avoid conviction for a crime. It has been reported that more than 30% of convicted murderers uh, claim to have no memory of their crime, and many of these cases probably involve simulated amnesia. Harrison et al. in 2017 published a study of 53 cases of psychogenic amnesia. 
They concluded that in most cases, the amnesic patient wanted to forget some of their unpleasant experiences and had, uh, to some extent, brought on the amnesic state deliberately. The authors argue that the resulting amnesia was real since the patient was genuinely unable to recall the memories in question. Harrison et al. suggests that these amnesic patients may be employing the same inhibitory mechanisms as those identified in studies of direct, uh, directed forgetting, which sounds to me like repression. I'm sorry. If it directed forgetting is real, um, then, uh, uh, then repression must be real. I, they argued in the next paragraph that, that Freud's repression, there was no, there was no proof. But if there's proof of directed forgetting, I would say, oh, golly, that's pretty close. The, brain, the effects of brain damage are usually irreversible, so it is not usually possible to restore normal memory function to those who suffer organic amnesia. This does not mean that nothing can be done to help them. There are a number of ways in which the lives of organic amnesics can be <clears throat> significantly improved by helping them to function as effectively as possible uh, within the limitations of their condition. This approach is known as rehabilitation. Some rehabilitation strategies involve the use of techniques uh, for maximizing the performance of those memory functions which re remain intact. Other strategies aim to bypass the impairment by finding alternative ways of carrying out a particular task by using external memory aids such as lists or electronic reminders. Most of the techniques used to maximize memory function and amnesia are based on methods which also help to improve normal memory. It can be helpful to encourage amnesic uh, patients to pay more attention to input, to repeat what is said to them, to organize items in memory, and to make meaningful associations between new input and items already in memory. A group of amnesics have, uh, who were trained to use these strategies, uh, this is according to Mulders et al. in 1995, achieved a significant improvement in the memory of performance compared with a control group of untrained amnesics, though their advantage was only temporary and gradually disappeared over the next few years. Wilson in 2004 suggested it's helpful to ensure that amnesic, uh, an amnesic is only required to learn one thing at a time, and it is important to keep the input simple, avoiding jargon or long words. Amnesics also perform better if their learning is not context-specific because the patient who has learned a memory uh, technique in one setting may not have the flexibility to use in the other technique. Uh, mnemonic techniques have also, been, have also proved to be helpful with some amnesics, though they were not found to be effective in the study of severely amnesic Korsakoff's patients. One type of memory which usually remains intact in amnesic patients is procedural skill learning. And this type of learning can be used in amnesic patients who are otherwise unable to learn new information consciously. Gliski et al. in 1986 successfully taught, amnes taught amnesic patients to operate computer packages which were previously unknown to them. Procedural skill learning has also been used to help amnesics to carry out everyday tasks such as washing, dressing, or making tea. Amnesic memory can be assisted by the use of external aids, putting big labels on cupboards or labeling doors as a reminder of which is the kitchen or the toilet. Environmental adaptations of this kind can help to make the, the amnesic's life easier and safer. Electronic devices and computerized systems have also been devised, which can be programmed to produce a reminder to carry out some action at a particular time, usually by emitting a warning beep, which draws attention to an instruction on the page. The first successful device of this kind was an electronic pager called NeuroPage, uh, which can be programmed to remind the user to perform 
a variety of tasks, such as taking medicine or keeping appointments. NeuroPage has proved to be very useful to uh, most amnesics who uh, like it. Ah, that's not it. This is it. That's the last one. Okay, external memory aids. Another memory uh, aid is the SenseCam, a small digital camera, which is attached to the user's belt to take photos of events experienced each day. The photos can be viewed later on, enabling the user to relive each event many times to help strengthen the memory. The camera is triggered automatically by a movement sensor, so users do not need to remember to take photos of key events. Loveday and Conway in 2011 reported that SenseCam enabled amnesics to achieve a significant improvement in subsequent memory for personal experiences, and this improvement was still evident nine months later. It also improved the user's sense of well-being and general happiness in many cases. Reviewing SenseCam uh, pictures can also add context to an event by reminding the user of the things they were doing and thinking at the time and of their uh, interactions with other people. SenseCam adds a richness to the memory and a sense of re-examining events. Recent studies have reported that the use of SenseCam improved memory performance in mild Alzheimer's cases and also in elderly normal individuals. Oh, I didn't, okay. Okay, <clears throat> that is it. Um, I apologize. I was going to sleep half the time uh, through this uh, lecture. Uh, I know it was boring me, so how could I possibly not be boring you? Uh, but uh, if you heard me falter or trip over some words, it was probably because I'm about to fall asleep. It's only 4.45 in the afternoon, but it sounds like this old man needs a nap. So I'll talk to you guys next week.